we uh, go ahead with inviting the guest speakers for our today's this particular session and we have two eminent guest speakers here to talk to us about various intervention approaches for which we uh, people you i mean occupational therapists can use with children with developmental disabilities yeah we could invite the second uh, speaker then dr ganpati would you yes. like to introduce the second speaker please <clears throat> our second speaker is dr dennis donika Dennis Donica is an associate professor and chair in the East Carolina University, Master of Science in Occupational Therapy, and she's a board in 2009 and has a wealth experience working with children. She has continued practice through research and has given over 20 national and 10 international presentations. She has published 16 peer-reviewed journal articles and published one book chapters on the topic of handwriting and keyboarding related skills. Dr. Tonika has been employed by Learning Without Tears for more than 10 years as a national workshop presenter, training others on handwriting without tears and keyboarding without tears program. Ma'am, I hand over the session. She is going to talk about exploring Virtual interproportional after school program to improve writing skills of children. Now, the, most of the children uh, find difficulty in the handwriting in the schools. So, due to pandemic, they are unable to attend the therapy intervention program as well as the education program. So, this is going to talk about how you are going to facilitate handwriting program through virtual. I think this uh, this session may be more informative. All the occupational therapists will learn new things uh, through this session. Session, hand over to you, ma'am. I agree with you and welcome, Dr. Danka. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Good afternoon. I'm Denise Donica, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy at East Carolina University. I bring greetings from North Carolina in the USA, and I am so excited to share with you about a program that was developed by and offered through East Carolina University in response to the challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic. I have also asked Dr. Lauren Turbyville, who assisted me in this study, to help me share the study with you today. You will hear from her a little bit later in the presentation. Please enjoy the photos from our experience throughout this presentation. The program that we offered was facilitated by four occupational therapy graduate students as part of their degree requirements. Having four students participate allowed one-on-one -on -one time with the participants to address personalized needs. The occupational therapy students learned about handwriting evaluation, observation skills, client-centered intervention planning, group process skills, and documentation of services provided. An exciting thing about this program is that it was an interdisciplinary project where we worked closely with Dr. Kennedy, who is a speech language pathologist and two of her graduate students. The writing program was originally Dr. Kennedy's idea a few years ago to address writing skills through speech language pathology. But a year prior to this study, she approached me about adding occupational therapy to the program to enhance what we could offer the families. We started this interdisciplinary project in spring of 2020 through an in-person after-school program, which was canceled halfway through due to the onset of COVID-19 in the United States. As we planned for our fall 2020 project, we first asked ourselves, what did we see? COVID-19 caused a swift and in many cases drastic change in education and therapy services. Seemingly overnight, children went from being taught by a teacher physically in the classroom to having to learn and complete assignments through a computer. Parents quickly took on the role of educator, while in many cases handwriting instruction and use decreased. 
Since COVID-19 limited the ability to offer in-person writing program we were trialing in, in spring of 2020, we decided to brainstorm what options we may have to help these children. So what did we know? We looked at existing literature to determine the next steps in our planning process. We know that children improve their handwriting skills through occupational therapy services. In fact, research has supported the use of learning without tears to improve handwriting skills in children of various ages. When looking at writing skills specifically, spelling and handwriting skills are both important and contribute to the overall writing success of students. In addition, research shows a relationship between handwriting and spelling. This research supported our program that we had offered in the past, but with the new complication of COVID-19, the need to explore the effectiveness of virtual intervention became increasingly important due to increased online therapy and educational services. However, there is less research on virtually administered services. So telehealth or virtual services are a method of intervention used successfully especially when in-person services are not viable. Telehealth services have been used to address student performance in the past, including handwriting skills, with improvements in high satisfaction noted. Telehealth has also been effective empowering parents. So what did we do? Based on what we saw and what we knew, we decided to develop and offer a virtual writing program to help support students and families during the pandemic with their writing skills. Therefore, this study used an interdisciplinary approach to address both handwriting and spelling skills through a virtual after school program. Next, we will look at the purpose in the study of the study and the methods that we used. The purpose of this interprofessional program was to help children improve their writing skills through the development of spelling through speech language pathology and handwriting mechanics through occupational therapy. As you can see from this picture, we also had fun while we were providing the service. Now let's take a closer look at who was involved in the program and what they did. This study used a single group pretest post-test design. We attempted to recruit eight participants, but only started with six. One participant dropped out due to lack of time. The remaining five participants were ages seven through 12, and they were enrolled in the I Can Write interprofessional virtual writing program that we offered. All gave consent for their data to be used in this research study. Participants in the program were required to have access to reliable internet during the program time and a device through which video conferencing could be used. Participants needed to be able to engage in a remote learning environment with only the support that the family was able to provide. Determining how to measure their skills virtually required the exploration of tools available. A tool we decided to use, which could be administered similarly in person and virtually, was here's how I write. This tool is a criterion referenced picture card interview where students assess their own performance of handwriting related to 24 items divided among student, student um, specific performance features. These include 19 items related specifically to handwriting performance, two items about the child's feelings about writing, and three physical factors related to handwriting. There's also a teacher rating form, but we are not including that in the data at this time. This tool is administered by showing the child both sides of the cards, as you see in the pictures. For example, I like to write, I do not like to write. And so the child would see both sides of the cards and they would select the side that they felt was most like them. Then they were asked, if they felt they always felt that way or they usually felt that way. This process is completed for each card and provides the therapist with a four point scale on which the student determines his or her perception of abilities. 
Now, Dr. Turbyville is going to share with you more about the actual program that we implemented. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk a little about the actual intervention program sessions. We began each week's session with a whole group activity, which lasted approximately 20 minutes. These whole group activities were either led by an OT student or a speech student, and the OT and speech students communicated with each other during the week to determine who would lead the group each week and what the activity would be. The whole group activities ranged from spelling games to visual memory games, with each activity addressing speech and OT skills. After the whole group sessions, the participants would join a breakout session. The participants would either begin with a 20 minute OT session and then switch to a 20 minute speech session or would begin with a 20 minute speech session and then switch to a 20 minute OT session. Each participant worked one on one with an OT graduate student, except one participant worked with two OT graduate students, just due to the number of participants versus the number of OT students. Following the program session, the team from occupational therapy and speech language pathology would meet virtually to discuss the session. What went well, what didn't, interesting responses of the participants, and would begin planning for the next week's session. Each participant was sent a package of materials for the program through the postal mail and received instruction on ways to use the materials throughout the program, as well as ideas for continued use after the program ended in order to continue practicing and improving handwriting skills at home. These manipulative kits included the following items. The magnetic lowercase and blackboard set was used by both speech language pathology and occupational therapy students. This was a great tool for occupational therapy students to introduce the size and position of lowercase letters, as well as placement of the letters on the lines and letter formations. Other manipulatives included small crayons that could be used to help facilitate proper grasp. We also included post-it note flags and small pencils for the participants to use in their workbook. So the kits included all of these items plus a handwriting workbook depending on the participant's grade level. Each participant had his or her own manipulative kit available to use during the sessions and each OT student also had access to her own manipulative kit as well as access to the interactive digital teaching tool to use through the video conferencing software. I will show you an example of this tool in a few slides. All of these items were used during the individual sessions and often incorporated into the group sessions as well. Now I'm going to talk through an example OT breakout session. Each OT student designed individual intervention sessions based on each participant's needs. The OT students typically began with a warm up activity before addressing handwriting mechanics. The pictures on this slide show an example of a warm up activity. The OT student is demonstrating hand positions that correlate with capital letters, tall letters like lowercase d, small letters like lowercase o, and descending letters like lowercase g. This activity helped the students visualize where letters sit on the baseline. Generally, after a warm up activity, the students completed handwriting lessons focused on formation, alignment, and spacing, and the OT students ensured a proper camera angle in order to view the student's handwriting. These lessons were located in the Learning Without Tears workbook that was sent to the students based on their grade level. At times, the intervention sessions also included handwriting demonstrations through the digital tool that Learning Without Tears offers. Here is an example of the Learning Without Tears interactive digital teaching tool. The OT student was able to share her screen with the participant so that each could view the same screen. Diver letters, lowercase p. Hi, I'm David. Check out how I dive. I'm up in my own bubbles. Now I swim over to the side. Watch lowercase d. It has to dive down to dive down, swim up and over, around, 
bump. Great job. Thank you, Dr. Turbyville. Now that you have learned more about the program, I will share a little bit about our procedure and then our conclusions that we discovered. After receiving approval for the study, we recruited participants from the in-person program that had been canceled the spring prior. And we also sent out an email to the university employees. We gathered parent permission and child assent as necessary electronically. Participants were all pre-tested in August or September of last year for the program through separate speech and occupational therapy virtual sessions. These were conducted within the two weeks of the program beginning. The program occurred during the fall semester, September through November for eight weeks. Post-testing for the program occurred in November in the same way as the pre-testing. When the sessions were conducted with the OT students, we needed to be able to communicate with the children without wearing masks. Therefore, we set up the environment where all four students were in the same physical building, but Dr. Turbyville and I were in separate rooms and those four students were all in individual rooms so that they could communicate with the students without having to wear masks. Dr. Turbyville and I were available for physical assistance if that was necessary. We also were logged into the virtual conference call so we could be reached by chat as well. And we observed with our cameras and microphones off during the sessions. That is why you don't see any masks in our photos. When looking at our outcomes, here's how I write, rates each response on a scale of one to four with the most positive being a four. Our results included the overall weighted score for each child at pretest in purple and post-test in yellow. Overall, the majority of our students had a higher post-test score than pretest on the Here's How I Write assessment. Student five attended only 50% of the sessions and student one also missed a session. Therefore, all of the students, two, three, and four, who attended all of the sessions had a higher post-test than pre-test. However, we did not feel like this overall score provided us with the complete picture of the impact this program may have had on the participants. Therefore, we decided to look at each individual item and count how many of their ratings stayed the same, how many got better, and how many got worse. You can see those numbers in this table. Student two had half of his ratings improved. Again, the student who attended all three sessions, two through four, showed more improvements, more items that got better than those who attended just a couple of sessions or not the whole program. The last column of this table um, was a total of how many items out of 24 improved or stayed the same. We felt that this gave us more information to help with our understanding. Due to our small sample size, no statistical analysis has been run on this data at this point, but we have looked at the data to draw some basic conclusions. This picture shows a writing sample from one of the students after the program was over. Overall, students were successful using the virtual platform to engage with the activities presented in the program. All participants had some skills they felt they improved upon, while those who attended the whole program reported more improvements, anywhere from seven to 12 of the 24 skills. Our conclusions suggest that consistent participation in all eight sessions may contribute to overall success. Another important outcome of this project was the lessons that the graduate students learned. During the debrief after our last session, we asked the students what they learned from their participation in the project. These are the things that they identified from their introduction to telehealth. They learned to be concrete when giving directions. They learned that having family available to help was very helpful to them. They learned that using visuals could be difficult because PowerPoint was not very engaging for the students. And so sometimes it was hard to engage them through the computer. They learned that flexibility is very important. They learned how to use an activity for more than one purpose. And they learned that working with other, another discipline 
um, while still in school was very valuable to them. Overall, we feel that this, this was a successful program, both for the participants who were able to improve their writing skills and for the graduate students who were involved in the design and implementation. We plan to offer another iteration of this program either over the summer or the fall to continue to reach students in need. Thank you all for joining us and for inviting us to share our, a little bit about our program that we did with you all. Please feel free to email us with any questions that you may have. We would love to hear from you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yes, you. Patty, please go ahead. Yes, ma'am, you can proceed. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Donica. And also, we did not uh, introduce Lauren uh, formally, so I would like to say welcome. Sorry, welcome, Lauren Jarbil. And uh, she is Dr. Uh, Dr. Lauren is an assistant professor in the East Carolina University and Master of Science in Occupational Therapy. I think uh, uh, what I'm going to say just now is probably going to resonate with Dr. Ganpati also. Please add your inputs through, sir. But I think what what appealed to me the most was, I mean, a couple of things were like, one, you gave ownership to children and your test, the assessment test was so beautifully designed that the children had had their voice to say, which is where were they struggling? That was one good thing. And the second part, of course, I liked was, you know, the involvement of occupational therapy students, because that's something all of us can use in our practice, because we have students here and connecting with families, what better way of doing that than actually doing on-field work with families to understand why it's essential to have the family involvement, why it's essential to get into the child's house and look at the environment and suggest OT. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. A nice presentation, ma'am. Very informative during the pandemic for all occupational therapists, as well as they used interproportional OT as well as the speech. Uh, so yes, welcome all uh, for this particular conference here. And we're looking forward to hearing about your topic on developmental pathways model. All of us, I think we agree that uh, the famous saying as it goes that you've seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. So we really need eclectic and com a com combination of different approaches. And that's what you're going to talk about. Uh, Dr. Maud is OTRL, SIPT expert DIR floor time training leader in an international and an international presenter on a wide array of topics. Since she opened her center in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania, USA in 2001, she developed her own model with regards to autism, dyspraxia, ADHD reading and learning, as well as attachment disorders. She owns and directs a clinical practice in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania, where she has become known for her effective assessment and intervention protocol. She co-authored the book, Our Greatest Allies, in 2011 with Lauren O'Malley, describing the journey of one child on the autism spectrum. Welcome, Dr. Maud Larue. Please proceed with your presentation. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to make a disclaimer. I am not a doctor and I'm not a PhD. I don't know where the credentials came from. I'm an occupational therapist and, um, and that is what I do. So um, I will share my screen with you. <laughs> I stopped sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank uh, both the chairs of the previous session, Dr. Anjali Zoshi and Dr. Yuganpati for conducting the session so smoothly. Uh, and uh, now we have with us Dr. Karen Jacobs. We all uh, must have heard her and seen her at multiple times. And she's a very well-known uh, uh, speaker. And her, uh, she's an Associate Dean and Digital Learning and Innovation at the College of Health and Rehabilitation Science at Surgit uh, College. She's a clinical professor, program director, 
at the Boston University. She has been the past president of A AOTA and she has got a laurels to her credit like Fulbright Scholarship, Award of Merit from Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists, Award of Merit from AOTA and AOTA Elena Clark's Lagelle Lectureship Award along with the Outstanding Mentor Award uh, conferred to her last year. She is, found, uh, she is founding editor-in-chief of WORG, a journal of prevention, assessment, and rehabilitation, and a board-certified professional ergonomist. A topic for today's presentation is MERP, Make Work From Home Work For You, Ergonomic Strategies to Support a Healthy Lifestyle. Ma'am, all to you. I am so happy to be here. Um, my greetings, my dear friends, um, for inviting me. And your conference is wonderful. I've been listening to it and looking at um, the program and I congratulate all of you. Thank you so much. Um, this is greetings from Boston um, and Boston University. This is a view from, from where I typically would live in Boston. But because of COVID, I moved out of the dormitory at Boston University where I typically live up to New Hampshire, which is about 70 miles uh, north of, of the Boston area. And I'm purposely don't have a fancy background or a green screen because I want you to see how we pivoted um, to be able to still provide um, occupational therapy education, telehealth to clients in um, a very different context than typical. So my presentation and the roadmap for my presentation is to briefly introduce ergonomics. Most of us know what that is, but just a little definition. And this is not a scientific paper, which is different from what I typically would do. This is sort of a hands-on thinking about how we pivoted um, to working from home and thinking about uh, the future and what we can do. And I'll be introducing that we are putting together um, a special issue of the work journal on working from home. And currently we have quite a few research projects going that if you invite me back, I'll be able to present on those about working from home. So um, you're gonna see lots of pictures of what people's homes look like as they work from home. And I want this to be interactive with you. So ergonomics, um, it's like peeling an onion in some ways very similar in how we would approach um, working with a client, you know, a person, environment, occupation model. But it's the science of work, of the people who do it, and the ways it's done, the tools and equipment they use, the places they work in, and the psychosocial aspects of the working situation. And this is a quote um, by Stephen Pheasant. So here's where I want participation. Does this look familiar? And I don't know if you can unmute yourself or put something in the chat box, but does this look like anything where you've been working from home? Thoughts, anybody wanna share? Let's see in the chat box type, does this look like anything from your own home environment? I don't know if anybody's going to put in the chat box, but I think um, we probably could relate, you know, to this working from bed. Um, this is actually a dog that um, has become the footstool. Um, again, in bed, a piano stool, papers everywhere. You know, we weren't necessarily prepared to work from home because we pivoted so quickly um, to um, going back to our home environments um, because of COVID. So we do have some statistics and the statistics are probably even changing now as, as um, some countries, some states, some towns are beginning to have um, people go back to school or to work. But when I got this original quote uh, of statistics about 42% of US and about 88% of the globe of uh, people were working from home or telecommuting full time. And at that point in time, there were about 3.4 billion people in 84 countries that had been confined to their homes. And again, some of this is becoming 
uh, changing because of the distribution of vaccines. And again, when you see these pictures, see if you can relate to any of them. So we saw studying from home. And again, this is a, a, a US perspective um, in March, 2020, and it's almost a full year now that more than 124,000 US schools closed, which impacted 55, a little over 55 million students. And the pandemic is still continuing. Although we're seeing some places like the state of Texas completely opened up um, for students to return to school, elementary, high school. Um, and again, you know, this is may change because of, of the pandemic as well. Um, but we saw it impacting family and their school choices very much. So students had and their parents had a choice of full-time on-time learning, full-time in-school learning for some places, remote and in-school, homeschooling and learning pods. And what I mean by learning pods were that, um, and this is just one example, families in a community got together um, and sort of created a pod where um, some of the education of their children might be happening from parents and a few children in the neighborhood would be there. And I love this example of this picture. This is actually my grand nephew. Um, there's three sons in, a, in a, an apartment in California and their mom creatively got cardboard that folded into threes and created work environments, school environments for each of her uh, sons so that they could have a quiet space. Typically he wears a headset and you can see it on the, the board um, so that he could do his work. So again, people became extremely creative and it was a partnership with parents because a lot of parents were home. So here's where I would like you again to think and if you don't wanna put it in the chat box, that's okay. Um, please think about where you are working, your location and how much time. Now, I purposely set this up for my presentation in a kitchen, okay? Um, and um, that is sometimes where I work. And we know that chairs for kitchen tables or dining room tables are typically not chairs that you would use for um, your everyday work. And I'll show you examples of how we can make changes to that. So throughout the day, I can be in the kitchen, I might be sitting on a, a comfy chair. Um, I might be um, in another space in the house. And one of the things that's really important if we apply ergonomics is to monitor our comfort and discomfort, to change and vary our postures as often as possible wherever we are and use whatever tools we have. So when we're looking at COVID, some of the challenges we all faced was a lack of transition between work, school, and personal life. Everything is happening in that same environment. And it's been hard for people to um, put space between the things that we're doing. In some cases, there may have been a lack of accountability and, and motivation. And now, you know, as we're getting into the year of COVID, a year that it, it, the pandemic started, we have COVID fatigue. There seems to be a lack of connection with others, lack of routine. And we know in occupational therapy how important routines are. A lack of control. Many people will share, they feel disorganized, they feel distracted, they feel overwhelmed. And we are seeing people reporting an increase in muscular discomfort, uh, musculoskeletal discomfort. And again, some of this information is in the evidence literature that I have sort of made very comprehensive here. So I want to take a minute and look at a structure for us that we can look at for working from home. Uh, the physical workspace, the cognitive load and psychosocial factors. So this model I've selected only those things that we have been seeing in working from home. There's many, many more that we could add here. And I wanna just share with you some very basic things that we've shared with people um, through using telehealth technology and actually word of mouth for um, clients we work with and for ourselves. And this is something I think that has become extremely important is for the occupational 
therapy practitioner to also make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. So I'm gonna share examples, examples that I've shared with clients and ones that I am personally doing so I can stay healthy through the pandemic and continue working from home. So the chair, I mentioned the chair and that I'm sitting in my kitchen. You're getting a picture of my kitchen chair over in this picture. I took a cushion to sit on. I took a towel and rolled it. And um, you could have a t-shirt, a pillow. I'll share with you another pillow that I'm using today um, because I already was becoming uncomfortable in the chair um, till it was my, my turn to present today. Um, if the chair is too low, we might use pillows to prop us up. And our feet, um, we have to be very careful about making sure that the postures that we're using um, are ones that enhance our ability to work and to learn. So I am five feet one. I am too short for my feet to hit the ground. So we can rest it on a box. And again, we pivot it. So everything that we might've had in our office, you know, like a footrest may not have been there. So I'm gonna pick up what I'm using. I do yoga. My yoga block is my footrest. Um, and actually, I think when I go back to my office, I think my yoga blocks are going with me because they, become, they became so much more comfortable than using a footrest. And again, these are practical things that um, we have been um, doing. So the work surface, what we find is that it's important to have a dedicated work surface. You want a hard surface, so you don't really wanna be working with your computer on your lap if you're using a notebook computer or a tablet. You wanna have ample leg space and you wanna remove any clutter that might be there. And some people had a beautiful setup like this in their homes, but others again, were using you know, a countertop. Um, and that's really important to make sure it's a, a, a flat surface where there's room for you. Now, maybe you were using a folding table um, or, um, you know, a table that had a rough edge. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but this is some tubing that plumbers around pipes. And so we got some of that tubing, sliced it, and put it on the edge of different counters so that we weren't having people using contact stress by leaning on their counters as well. So again, very simple things in um, home environments to use. Workspace again and work surface, you know, some people, and I, this is not me, got a, a treadmill and they were working and exercising and they had three screens. And I can't say that this is a very ideal ergonomic setup, but it was something that someone was doing. Or, you know, we could take our kitchen countertops or whatever higher surface we had and make a standing um, area as well. And I do wanna share this with you. With the monitor, um, you want to make sure that the monitor is positioned um, away from you, arm's length with a closed fist. The screen is at top or slightly below eye level. Your neck is straight. You're perpendicular to a window. The window's over here for me to avoid, avoid glare. And one of the things that has been extremely important is lighting. And so we want to have enough lighting, not glare, um, for everyone. And I love this. You probably heard in the US and around the world um, that it was hard to get tissue paper. So people were using tissue paper that they had stored um, to raise their, their computers. People became very, very creative. This is hat boxes, this is books, um, to, to be able to put their computers into a more uh, ergonomic correct position. And then keyboards, some of the things that became really important here was people using their keyboards and complaining that their hands, their arms, their shoulders, their heads, their necks were bothering them because they were doing much more keying. And so this is just some examples of making sure that your arms are close to your body and your elbows are near, your shoulders are relaxed, you're keeping your wrists straight or floating. Um, one of the things that we have been really encouraging people to do is to follow along what we have on this mouse pad. And I can um, share an email of that if other people want this. 
um, to set up your station as best as possible to follow these guidelines of working comfortably and changing and vary your postures often. So one of the things that we've been recommending is looking at voice recognition software. And if people are using Google Docs, that is easily built in and free um, soft um, voice recognition software. Smartphones. Smartphones became extremely important during the pandemic. Um, we saw a, a, a real digital divide with people having access to the internets in, the, in their homes. People were having to drive to locations where they could tap into uh, internet in a McDonald's or a Dunkin' Donuts. Um, and people started using their smartphones, which probably would not be the tool of choice for teaching and learning and working all day. So when we're using a smartphone, we wanna be very selective in emails and texts. Again, voice recognition software is really important. Try to use abbreviations um, and try not to be on that smartphone, if at all possible, for more than 10 minutes um, and to do some hand stretching exercises and try to avoid using just one finger. Um, I have a recent article that just came out about um, thumb um, issues and we are seeing an increase in that um, because of a lot of the work that we've been doing intensively with technology. So if we're looking now at cognitive load, and again, I just picked three areas that relate to um, COVID to discuss. Time management has been a big issue and as a cognitive load. And here's where I wanna just share with you some examples that you could put into your life. You could suggest it to the people that you work with and your colleagues and the clients that you serve. Keeping to routines, creating boundaries to maintain work-life balance, okay? Um, really important because what we've found with COVID is that everything is sort of just blurred together. Setting realistic scheduling, including breaks, and we're gonna take a stretch break during my presentation in just a minute. Prioritizing and setting clear deadlines, chunking tasks to decrease the feeling of being overwhelmed. Setting limits, saying no. Um, that's something that's very hard for many of us, myself definitely included. But we want to make sure that if we say no, we use that time for self-care. Delegating, and here's really important. Many of you may be parents who have been home helping your children be able to be in school as well. So delegating, taking shifts for caregiving is really important. And then finally, eliminating controllable distractions, if at all. Isolation, motivation, um, and loss of control are some psychosocial factors that people are reporting. And again, I want you to see all these photos of how kids are in school. And this is one of my granddaughters and she is in class on her bed um, talking to her classmates. Again, um, would I recommend that? No. Is it happening? Yes, as well. Okay, so let's take a look for a moment. Um, about isolation and what we can do. Now, taking walks, stretching, talking, of course, when we're outside, we would wear masks. Spending time in nature is extremely important, even if it's five minutes of opening the door, going outside. And if you can't go out to nature, bring nature in, have a plant, you know, have um, a pet, a fish. Um, even pictures of nature. And I wish you could see this. My walls are all photographs of nature, some from India. Um, and that brings, I think, that sense of calm and peace. Engaging in favorite occupations. I think a lot of us um, started doing more cooking, but if you have family members, engage with them as well. And you can do this virtually. Every Wednesday night, I teach virtual healthy vegetarian cooking um, where people can join me. And that has been a really great um, occupation to do to help 
alleviate that feeling of isolation. Catching up with friends and colleagues, um, if you have technology like Zoom or FaceTime or Skype or any other, you know, regularly scheduling times to meet with them virtually. And if at all possible, trying to do sports. So I do yoga once or twice a week and I do it virtually and that's been really helpful. So again, I'm sharing with you things that I personally have done, family members, other colleagues have done to help during COVID, to help provide strategies to stay healthy. Motivation has been really challenging. And we're seeing with COVID fatigue now that that is even you know, becoming more pronounced. We wanna create an individual learning environment. We wanna rotate those occupations that we're doing, take active breaks. So I teach um, online virtually and have been doing that since March, 2020, a year ago. And one of the things that I have put into my teaching is having the students take a break every 30 minutes. And um, it might be walking around in their area, it might be getting up and stretching, um, but putting breaks in is important, staying organized. Receiving rewards, and it can be just a verbal reward, you've done such a great job managing um, the pandemic. Participating in 3D occupations, um, art, games, things like that have been really great to foster motivation. So we've got a loss of control as another thing. Um, Self-scheduling is really important. Optimizing privacy, you saw in that, um, that one of those slides where my, my niece created this environment that provided privacy for the students. That's really important for us as workers too, and as parents and family members. Focusing on what can really be done, following a regular school work transition. Um, what we've been encouraging people to do, and I'm doing it too, get dressed in the morning. Um, get dressed, follow the routine that you would have. You know, for me, I get a cup of tea, do my yoga, um, do stretching, sit down, do work. And, and make sure that I am following my regular routine. And for children, one of the things that we've really talked about is pack their backpacks, you know, put in what they need for the day, and then they can take out what they're using each day. And what we're finding is as students return to the school environment, what they're putting in their backpacks is a little bit different than what they had before. And in fact, we're finding that the backpacks now are heavier because of the inability for children to share things when they get into school. Um, so backpack safety is gonna be really important again. Make time to move, be active, and really start practicing taking care of yourself and mindfulness and meditation is so important. So here's another picture. Does this look like any of your environments? This one here is actually Piaget. Um, and he's, as you know, a very famous uh, psychologist who is no longer with us. So I just wanna conclude with saying, let's take a break. So everybody, let's stand up for a minute and just take a stretch break because I know you've been sitting for a long time through the conference. So just get up and stretch and we'll do that quickly. Um, I like encouraging people to take a stretch break every 20 minutes for 20 seconds and look away. Um, that may not be realistic in going to meetings, but every 30 minutes will be great. Um, for any resources that you need on my um, blog, I have lots of ergonomic resources and articles. And here's my shout out um, to um, the special issue of work devoted to working from home. Um, we will be submitting our research there. It's double blind peer review. And I encourage other people to, if you are doing research, telehealth, um, anything related to, to work with children, adults, please submit your papers. And I wanna thank you. I hope some of these strategies are going to help you live life to its fullest pay it forward, let other people know. So thank you so much and congratulations on your conference. Would you have any questions that I could ask? Yeah, uh, please, Hi. participants, Ima. 
all the participants please uh, note your questions in the chat box if any i think uh, i think people are fatigued today <laughs> cognitive overload <laughs> yeah and i you know again i thank you for this invitation um and again it wasn't a scientific paper but i'm where i'm worried is that occupational therapy practitioners are not taking care of themselves. And I hope that there were some practical applications here for yeah, us. Yeah, we have just a comment that uh, uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar has expressed uh, his thanks for your fascinating experience. And does the context have an influence on, on the work from home? Like working in India is certainly different from working Absolutely. from, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, um, I gave a, a very much American perspective here. Um, and I welcome um, people sharing what it's been like in, in, in their country. Um, and I hope people will sh submit to the work journal any research they've been doing, but commentaries as well. You know, we welcome really sharing that the context has really been so different in the experience of COVID has been so different everywhere. And you know, in the United States, it's even state by state. We have 50 states and each state has been different. Each community has been different. I'm here uh, glad to, on behalf of scientific committee, I'm glad to inform you that we have a special section of award, MN Sangoy Award for best paper in ergonomics. So uh, yeah, yeah, we have uh, instilled it uh, in already recent times, and actually we are getting more and more papers in that category. So this year also we have received uh, three papers, and uh, I think people in India are getting into this uh, field of research. It was wonderful, and I think you have paved the way for many uh, youngsters out here um, uh, to take up this as topic of their research and uh, study further. And I'm sure you will be of great help to them. And you, we have we have graduated using your book and uh, it was wonderful seeing you live here. Thank you so much for sparing your time. On behalf of entire scientific committee, Dr. Lakshmanan, the organizing secretary, Dr. Jyotika Bijlani, honorable president and vice president, secretary of AIOTA, we heartfully thank you for being with us today. Thank you so Thank much, you so much for this invitation. I look forward to the next time I see you all in person. WFOT 2022, and please invite me back to India. I'd love to see all of you, but be safe, be healthy, and congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so much. Bye-bye. Bye. With that, we come to an end of first day of the mega event scientific program, OTCON 2021. And I'm sure you need to have some stretch break and stretch your body with Kalatarang, the student cultural event to be started shortly at 6.30 p.m. Please be there uh, so to witness the mega event, the Kalatarang. Thank you. <laughs>